By the time we meet Tywin in the books, he is a controlling, ruthless, intelligent, politically minded, and calculating man in his 50s who had dedicated his life to helping his house rise in power and respect. Physically, he was tall with long legs, thin arms corded with muscles, broad-shouldered, and as lean as a man 20 years younger than him. Many people noticed his stern face, hard mouth, bushy golden side whiskers, and a bald head he made sure to keep shaved as soon as his once thick golden hair began to recede. He, in general, was an impressive guy when we met him in the books. Heck, his armor was impressive, putting even his son Jamie's to shame. First, his great cloak was layers of countless cloth of gold that was so heavy it barely stirred when he charged, and so large it covered most of his stallion's hindquarters when in his saddle. This cloak was held in place by a pair of miniature lioness crouching on his shoulders as if ready to spring. He wore the finest plate, heavy steel enameled a deep, dark crimson that shone like the light of the rising sun. And of course, he had ornate gold scroll work inlaid in his gauntlets, greaves, and breastplate. His roundels were golden sunbursts, and a lion crested his great helm with one paw raking the air as it roared. And the lion and the two lioness had ruby eyes because this is Tywin Lannister. His longsword had a gilded scabbard with rubies as well. And let's not even get started on the horse he would ride. However, despite the impressive body and fancy armor, it was said his eyes had always been the most unsettling thing about Tywin Lannister, and that they could turn any man's bowels to water. Pale green, almost glowing, with flecks of gold in them, they were eyes that could see inside you and see just just how ugly, worthless, and weak you were deep down inside. And when he looked at you, you knew how pathetic you were. However, before he earned the ability to intimidate even the bravest of men with those eyes, and before we knew him in the books, Tywin Lannister had five decades of experiences that shaped him into the powerful man he became. A man that, according to characters in the series, comes around once in a thousand years. So for this video and part one, let's talk about Tywin from birth to 262 AC. Tywin Lannister was the firstborn son to Tytos Lannister and Lady Jane Marbran and first grandson of Gerald the Golden in 242 AC. And I'm sure you can guess that Tywin came into the world as feisty as he left it. Legend states that when his grandfather Gerald attempted to ruffle the newborn baby's golden hair, Tywin bit his finger, already trying to show people he would be respected or they would regret it. Sadly, at the age of two, his grandfather would die of a bad bladder and being unable to pass water, so Tywin wouldn't have any real memories or very clear ones of his grandfather. His grandfather's death also meant that Tywin's father became Warden of the West, Shield of Lannisport, and Lord of Casterly Rock, titles his father should have never had and earned through a series of tragedies. The same year Tytos became Warden of the West, Tywin would welcome a new baby brother, Kevin, into the world. Kevin would be followed the next year by his sister Jenna, and five years after her, another brother named Tyget. A last brother, Jerian, would appear five years after him, but let's go back to the beginning years of Tytos' rule. Growing up, Tywin had the immensely frustrating misfortune of having a father that was a terrible ruler. Or maybe it was a blessing, as it pushed him harder to be a better man than his father. Tytos was just far too trusting, too soft, too weak-willed, and too indecisive to be a good ruler. He disliked war, and instead of acting on insults and threats, he would laugh them away when most of his ancestors would have had their swords out. This weak-willed and forgiving nature made him ripe to be taken advantage of. Many saw Tytos' rule as the perfect time to claim wealth, land, and power. His people began to borrow heavily from Casterly Rock and had no fear in not repaying the loans. Lord Tytos would simply extend the debts or forgive them, so why should they fear not paying back House Lannister? When others of the Westerlands caught wind of Tytos' generosity, people, even and common merchants began to flock to the rock, begging for loans and taking vast amount of gold. Because the Lord's people had such little fear and respect for him, corruption began to spread throughout the Westerlands as his decrees and rules were largely ignored. In fact, disrespecting the Lord of Casterly Rock became a game called Twisting the Lion's Tail. Young knights and some squires tried to outdo each other as they attempted to twist the lion's tail the hardest. 
At feasts and balls, guests would feel free to mock Titus, even sometimes to his face. They joked about toothless lions. In his need to be loved, no one laughed louder at these jokes and insults than Lord Titus himself. And as Tywin watched his father's misrule and the laughter aimed at the Lord of Casterly Rock and their house, he began to despise weakness and mistrust laughter. These feelings would only intensify as Tywin grew. Less than 10 years into Titus's rule, and even lords outside the Westerlands began to become aware that the Lannisters were no longer to be feared. Late in 252 AC, Titus agreed to marry his seven-year-old daughter, his precious little princess Jenna, to a younger son of Walder Frey. A terrible match, but Titus, never wanting to upset others, announced the betrothal at a feast with half the Westerlands in attendance. At the announcement, Lady Ellen Tarback laughed aloud, and Lord Roger Rain left the hall in anger. No one outright questioned Lord Lannister on this decision, except for Tywin. At 10 years old, he was already a fearless and iron-willed child beyond his years. Those around the boy could already see that he was nothing like his father. Tywin criticized the match in some pretty scathing terms. His outrage at his sister's poor match was so intense, his father's face turned white. Though Lord Lannister still went through with the betrothal, it was clear to others that Tywin would one day be a force to be reckoned with when he became Warden of the West. And of course, when Jenna and Walder Frey's son finally did wed, it was said Tywin gave him a nervous belly for a wedding gift, and that the man continued to live in fear of Tywin, for the rest of his days. Though, of course, Jenna helped with that as well by dominating the hell out of her husband. Shortly after his outburst about the marriage arrangement, Tito sent Tywin to King's Landing to be a cupbearer at King Aegon's court. This was a fantastic decision on Tito's part, as at court, Tywin met the future King Aerys II and the heir to Storm's End, Stefan Baratheon. The three boys became good friends and developed a relationship that would serve them in the coming war. Later, Tywin's cousin and future wife, Joanna Lannister, who he had met when they were children at Casterly Rock, was also present and serving as a lady-in-waiting to Princess Rhaella Targaryen. But that wasn't until he had been at court for quite a few years. Tragically, while at court, Tywin's mother would die giving birth to his new brother, Jerrion, in 255 AC. In 260 AC, Tywin finally got a chance to test his skills as a warrior when the War of the Nine Penny Kings, the fifth and final Blackfyre Rebellion, broke out. With the war came the chance for Tytos' three eldest boys, Tywin, Kevin, and Tygett, to prove themselves. Though Tytos, hating war and fighting and still depressed over the death of his wife, didn't go, he instead gave his brother Jason Lannister command of 11,000 Westerland forces. Tywin was knighted on the eve of the conflict and fought with Jaehaerys' young heir, Ares, Prince of Dragonstone. Unfortunately, Tywin's uncle Sir Jason died in battle on Bloodstone in 260 AC, but Sir Roger Rain seized control of the Westermen and led them to many victories. Victories and battles that made Tytos' three boys hardened warriors. The entire rebellion, Tywin and his brothers formed bonds, grew wiser, and more skilled, all things that would aid them in their future. By the end of the war, Tywin would knight Ares himself. Tytos' second-born Kevin also proved himself while squiring for the Red Lion and was knighted by Lord Rain. While the third boy, Tygett, was too young to be knighted, he was still impressive for his age. He killed a grown man in his first battle and three more in later fights, including a knight of the Golden Company. Tygett's courage and skilled arms would be noticed by all, according to Maesters. So you can imagine when the three boys got back from war after forming bonds with not only their fellow Westermen but lords from all over the realm, they were changed. The boys were very aware of the low regard the other lords had for their father Tytos. Tywin, always a strong-willed person, decided when he got back from the rebellion that he was going to restore the power and pride of Casterly Rock and House Lannister even though he wasn't Lord of Casterly Rock yet. He had had enough of the laughter aimed at his house. Tytos protested feebly, but then retreated to his wet nurse while Tywin set out to fix the Westerlands. To clean up the region where bandits and outlaws roam more so than before due to Tytos' continuous weakening rule, Tywin formed a new company under the command of his brother Kevin. This company consisted of 500 knights that had become blooded and seasoned warriors on the Stepstones. Under Kevin, they rode around the Westerlands, getting rid of robber knights and outlaws. At the same time, Tywin demanded repayment for all the loans and gold Tytos had handed out. The young heir demanded that if anyone couldn't repay the gold, they were required to send hostages to Casterly Rock as assurance 
one day they would. Some obeyed quickly when the debt collectors came to their homes. Sir Harris Swift, the Knight of Cornfield, gave up his daughter when he was unable to pay his debts to Sir Kevin as a hostage with zero resistance, noting the lion had awoken. However, others didn't feel they needed to listen to Tywin, who was not Lord of Casterly Rock, nor the Warden of the West, yet. They liked the growing power they had under Titus's weak rule, and weren't willing to give it up just yet, if ever. Some met the Collectors with sullen resistance, while others met them with open defiance. Lord Rain, whose house had been growing especially powerful under Tywin's father's rule, laughed aloud when his maester read Tywin's demands. He told his friends and vassals to not heed the order and to simply do nothing. Lord Tarbeck, whose house had also grown more powerful recently with the Lannisters' gold paying for massive upgrades around his keep, didn't listen to Lord Rain, but instead took matters into his own hands. He rode directly to Casterly Rock, intent on speaking to Lord Tytos about reigning in his son. Unfortunately for Lord Tarbeck, Tywin, not Tytos, was waiting for him at the lion's home. Tywin considered his act defiance against his house and promptly sent him to the dungeon. While Tywin probably thought the Tarbecks would quickly obey, he underestimated Lady Tarbeck, a woman who had dreamt all her life of being Lady of Casterly Rock. After failing to do that, even after marrying two Lannisters, and now part of House Tarbeck, she wasn't going to bow down to the lions. Instead, she sent her knights to capture three Lannisters. Two of them were Lannisters of Lannisport, distant relatives of the Lannisters of Casterly Rock, but the third was Stafford Lannister, a young squire and the eldest son and heir of Sir Jason, the dead brother of Tytos Lannister. While Lord Lannister had mostly hidden himself away, enjoying his son's wet nurse, this finally put him into action. Tytos hated upsetting people and didn't want to risk any bloodshed. In trying to avoid those things, he actually led both of them to happen eventually, but we'll get there. So what Tytos did next straight pissed off Tywin. He commanded Lord Tarbeck be released, apologized to the man, and forgave all his debts. Lord Lannister picked Lord Rain, Lady Tarbeck's brother, and Castamere as a safe place to exchange the hostages. Tywin was meant to attend, but he refused, you know pissed off. So his brother Kevin returned Lord Tarbeck at Castamere and collected the captured Lannisters. At the meeting, Lord Rain threw a huge feast where toasts and exchanges of kisses, vows, and gifts were made. Everyone there promised to be faithful friends through all of eternity. Their mistake? Tywin wasn't there, and he made no such vows. Less than a year later, late in 261 AC, Tywin demanded that Roger and Reynard Rain and Lord and Lady Tarbeck answer for their crimes. Tywin was not letting this go, and he was getting his family's gold and respect back. Both Lord Tarbeck and Rain decided, nah, and openly rebelled against the Lannisters, which was all part of Tywin's plan. He had already called his bannermen before sending the ravens, knowing that this would be the outcome. He didn't even tell his father as he collected 500 knights and 3,000 men and crossbowmen to deal with the Reigns and Tarbecks. He attacked Lord Tarbeck first before the man could even alert his vassals. Despite not having his vassals, Lord Tarbeck rode out with only his household knights, which was a huge mistake. The battle was a slaughter, with Lord Tywin crushing Lord Tarbeck and his meager forces. But defeating them in battle wasn't enough. Tywin left no room for Lord Tarbeck to rise up again against the Lannisters. After the battle, he beheaded Lord Tarbeck, his son, his nephews, cousins, daughters, husbands, and anyone that displayed the Tarbeck sigil. Tywin then marched on Tarbeck Hall with the heads of Lord Tarbeck and his sons before them impaled on spears where the crafty Lady Tarbeck was waiting for them. She had closed the gates and sent a message to Castamere asking her brothers for help. She thought she could hold out until her brothers came as a siege would take a while. What she didn't realize was Tywin was ready for a siege and there wouldn't be enough time for her brothers to come to her rescue. Within a day, he brought down the castle's old keep, crushing Lady Tarbeck and her son when it collapsed. Some people say Tywin, who never smiled due to his distrust of laughter, smiled when the keep crushed Lady Tarbeck. With the death of Lord and Lady Tarbeck, those inside the hall surrendered, but Tywin wasn't done. An example needed to be set. He ordered for the castle to be burned down, and for a day and night it burned until all that was left was a black shell. The rains arrived to see the castle burning, 
knowing they were too late to help their sister. What was worse, they realized that their 2,000 men were vastly outnumbered by Tywin's hosts. Though there are conflicting numbers, some say three to one, some say five to one, it was large enough to be another slaughter. Despite the surprise attack, Tywin's greater numbers led to another victory, forcing Lord Rain to retreat as half his men lay dead in the field. If you think that was enough for Tywin, that he would now go home knowing he made his point, you don't know Tywin. He followed on the heels of the man and three days later arrived at Casimir, ready to make more examples for others to learn from. Now here's a little bit about Casimir, the seat of the reigns. Rich mines ran under the castle and it was a great source of wealth for the reigns during the Age of Heroes. To protect these mines, they had built castle walls around the entrance of it with an oak and iron gate with two stout towers on either side. These mines went very deep and nine tenths of the castle was actually beneath ground, which is pretty neat. To protect themselves against the attack they knew was coming, they fled to these mines. Lord Rain at this time was feverish from an arrow wound he had taken in the back during his retreat, so control went to his younger brother, Lord Reynard, an incredibly smart man. Once safe in the tunnels, Lord Reynard sent terms to Lord Tywin above. Instead of answering the man, Tywin ordered for the mines to be sealed. Using picks, axes, and torches, Tywin's men brought down tons of rock and soil, burying the Great Gate so no one could get in or out. But Tywin didn't stop there. He took note of a small swift stream that ran by the castle. The first day he dammed the stream. The next two days he had the stream diverted to the nearest mine entrance. While the entrance could no longer allow anyone in or out, it did allow for water to trickle through. More than 300 men, women, and children were in those mines. And not a single one ever came out. A few guards reported hearing screams and shouting beneath the earth one night, but by the day, there was only silence. The mines of Casimir were never opened again, and the castle was burnt down by Tywin. This event gave rise to the song, The Reigns of Casimir. A song that is enough to strike fear in people's hearts and remind them why you don't mess with Tywin Lannister or his house. Some criticized Tywin for his cruelty after he made House Tarbeck and House Rain extinct, but many more respected and feared him. And because of this, Tytos had no more problems with any of the Westermen for the rest of his time as Warden of the West. If they thought of causing trouble, they had only to look at the burned out halls and keeps of Casimir as a testament to the fate that would await them. In fact, some years later, Lord Farman of Faircastle became a bit defiant and all it took was Tywin sending an envoy bearing a loot to play the Reigns of Casimir to calm him right back down. After the performance, Lord Farman was quite quiet and obedient. Unfortunately and fortunately, Tywin's cruelty and the extreme measures he was willing to go to to win stayed with him. When comparing strategies, people would agree that Tywin would sooner burn down a town and every living creature in it, babies, noble knights, septons, whores, rats, pigs, men and boy alike, than waste time by searching for his enemy within. However, this act drew the attention of his boyhood friend, Ares II, who had just been crowned king. In 262, at the age of 20, Tywin was going to become the youngest hand of the king. Some of his best and worst years laid before him. So in part two, I'll talk about Tywin from the age of 20 to the death of his wife. In part three, I'll talk about the rest of his life right to before the books. Thanks for watching, please like and subscribe.